we have all the sectors of Omaha Beach, we are here. Uh, the latitude, yeah, just here. For B, J to the B Street Road, very narrow road. So the two exits at that time were only the D1 and D3. They were roads, little roads. Only that part of the of Omaha was paved that had a road. Here there was nothing. So we are just below WN62. And that's the detailed map of WN62 behind us. We are here. So that here was like that. Okay. Yeah. And before in front, so WN62 again is here on Omaha with all the sectors. And bunker was at the bottom of the tree. Very small bunker for a sniper. Then you have, uh, you can see, it's actually, you see the tree, it's on the left of the tree. Mm -hmm. You can see a little bit of concrete and a very small opening. This is where the kind of was. He's now known for a D-Day specialist as the Beast of Omaha. He passed away in 98. Uh, that's him. That's in uh, 94 at the cemetery and uh, 43, 1943 still in Russia. So he was positioned position in Russia. Here he is with his friend Franz Gokul. Then, because he lost two toes in Russia, Russia in a like in convalescence, he was sent to Normandy. And what exactly did he do again? On D-Day, he was shooting. He was, he, had, he was like a cannoneer, so first rank. And on D-Day, he was uh, given two machine guns and he shot the whole day from this small bunker. He started a little bit higher, but from 9 a.m. to 6.30 uh, p.m. he was there shooting non-stop. He had two machine guns so, and continuous ammunition, so some guys were bringing in ammunition and shooting non-stop, non-stop. We don't able to walk, or maybe if you want you can walk this rock. Hold on. The rock you see here. Uh, is a plaque. The rock is a remaining of the Mulberry A of the American Artificial Harbor, and on this plaque in 2004 was put a, on this rock was put a plaque, uh, and on this plaque are written all the names of the medics uh, who tried to save, some, to heal and save some of the wounded guys on, on Omaha, and there were many, many, 2,185 men uh, killed on Omaha, and another thousand heavily wounded, so 4,000 casualties. In this firm, compact. That was really the key for D-Day, for the success of Normandy, to have long open beaches with compact sand so that trucks and heavy vehicles can drive everywhere and get out. Not like in Dieppe in 42. In Dieppe in August 42, the beach was very small and had big round rocks. So all the trucks got stuck here, no problem to drive. And how far is it when it goes low tide? Low tide, it can go up to 700 meters. Thank you. It depends on the top. Port en maybe we can see far away, there's like a pier going at sea. That's Port en Bessin, where was the refinery. It's really the beginning of Omaha, Sector George. And all the way there, Sector uh, Charlie, see by the cliffs. And after these cliffs, it's the second cliffs of Point du Hoc. These cliffs are called the Cliff de la, la Percée. So we, have sec uh, we are now right now on Sector uh, Fox. Uh, Easy and Fox 762, so Fox Green, and over there, Charlie C D E F G. So, this is Omaha Beach, that part that juts out into the ocean. That's one end of it, comes all the way through here. And these rocks are natural rocks. This is how the beach looks. It's not put in here, it's not for soil erosion or anything like that. And then, as you scan further down, that's Charlie, way on the other end, and that's where Omaha Beach ended. So it's a very big beach, a lot of gun emplacements up at the top. You can see. Okay. I brought you here, Kenneth, so that you understand that when the GIs landed, they were really blind uh, in a way that they could not see where are the targets. They were uh, more than 1,200 targets everywhere, but you can see when you are here, you're really low on the beach and what they could see was only fire smoke they couldn't see what the germans are they were too many and covered with ivy with vegetation it was impossible to see you can see a cannon there and another one and the fire the big guns were shooting crossfire sideways on, on, on the gis 
only facing them were many many snipers here at the 62 there were 14 snipers 200, 220 millimeters and 288 millimeters and a bunch of mortar at the flame doors so here you can see the cell tower they had a gun emplacement up there and another one over here and it controlled this road that you see in front of us that's the only road that led out of Omaha and it took a, a tank to come up and um, drew fire onto the one on the left and the gentleman went in from the back uh, used grenades in an open window that the French resistance said it was a, a, an area where they could get into and then he used the gun and turned it and fired on this location over here. There were no houses or anything here when this was going on. So just bunkers. So now you can see they're gone. But that was the main road off of Omaha Beach. So the monument, this one uh, there in concrete was put in 1954. So just 10 years after the war. There is a similar monument on Utah Beach. Uh, and the one on the beach, like waves or with metal, was made, it was put here in 2000 to represent the bravery of the soldiers, the bravery of the Big Red One of the 29th Infantry Division and of the 116th Infantry Regiment. In the center you have like three pillars representing the three units and on the side waves. So the, the three units are like one all together because they were really fighting as one, all very connected, helping each other and waves pushing them from England. To get on D-Day because from 6.30 to noon that's the only spot where you were safe. The snipers could not see you there. The moment you make two meters this way, you're a target. I said until up to noon, because from six to noon, yes, you were safe on the snipers. From noon, from midday, the problem is that the battleship, the destroyers, would get as close as possible, even touching the sand, even the bottom of the ship were touching the sand, to replace tanks. Tanks did not make it on Omaha at all. They all sunk because of this stupid skirt making them float. It was a stupid idea. So destroyers get got closer, shot on the German positions, and the guys right there could receive wood, concrete, shrapnel, everything would fall there. So there was no safe spot any, no, anymore. The wall is the same, the same as uh, what it was before. It was a wall built to stop vehicles, not infantry. It was a wall built to stop big vehicles. That's all. Soldiers were buried in this field. I'll show you the video when it was inaugurated. They were under the house. No one is buried now. They were where is the house? By the tennis courtyard. It was a big field. Then it became too small quickly, uh, by the end of June it was too small, so a second temporary grave site was organized. That's the one at uh, Colville Saint Laurent, the one where you're going to go. Uh, it started also as a temporary cemetery. You see three guns in place here, one in front, here, one right up there, one up in the middle, hard to see, carved out in the So the Normandy American Cemetery is 175 acres. Uh, there are 9,388 uh, US soldiers buried here, including also four women. Uh, one was in the Red Cross in USO, three were in the in a postal battalion part of the 6888. You have three medals of honor, and but the sad thing is that the average age here is 22 years old. The flags you see are uh, lifted at 9 a.m. every morning and stay up until 4 p.m. At 4 p.m. the two both flags are lowered 
first the one uh, the one close to us and the next one and the pl taps is played also at 4 p.m. precisely when the, the flags are folded so you see mostly Latin crosses uh, all facing uh, west actually the names are on the other side facing home United States the head of the soldier is facing the rising sun and east as it should be in a cemetery Rest in honor of glory and comrade in arms, known but to God. He is one of the 476 unknown soldiers of the American cemetery. 100% sure it's an American, but that's the only thing we can tell. Uh, there was no ID, no picture, no dog tag missing, just US uniform. That's all. This is a copy of an old picture of the Normandy American Cemetery in 1945. At the very beginning, uh, up until 46, the cemetery was still temporary. The crosses up to 56 were made out of wood and painted white. There was no access to the public. It was only uh, allowed to officials and relatives. So something about the private visits at the cemetery. If you have a relative buried at the cemetery, uh, you just go on abmc.gov, you put the name of the person, if it's in Normandy, it will show you that he is in Normandy, and uh, then you'll have a plot letter, a lane number, a row number, and then you can get escorted by a, an official guide of the cemetery, who will take uh, some sand from Omaha, first sand of Omaha, the sand will be put on, on the letters of, the, of your relative, so that it looks like a medal of honor, it shines, and you get a flag to put uh, by the cross, and a picture, anything you want. So here is the grave of uh, Ted Roosevelt Jr., son of President um, Teddy Roosevelt, the conservative president uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Ted Roosevelt Jr. died on July 12, 44 in Normandy from a heart attack. He he's the only general who landed on a first wave on, on D-Day. He landed on Utah Beach. Plane. So here is the grave of Quentin Roosevelt, brother of Ted Roosevelt Jr who uh, died in, on July 14, 1918 in the First World War. He was buried at the Meuse-Argonne Cemetery, northeast of France, and brought here in 1955 at the request of the Roosevelt family, and he's the only soldier who did not fight in, Norman, in the Second World War buried here. Because so these are the graves of Preston and Robert Nyland, the brothers who inspired the movie Saving Private Ryan. In the movie, there were five brothers, and the last one is Matt Damon, uh, Tom Hanks is supposed to find him. The real story is that there were four brothers, two died in Normandy, one on July, uh, on June 7th, Preston Nyland, Robert Nyland on D-Day, he was an 82nd Airborne, Fred Nyland was 101st Airborne and decided to quit the Airborne while he was in England, so before D-Day. Ed Nyland was deployed in the Pacific, he was US Air Force, and he's the missing in action. He was actually missing in action for one year and found only in May 46 way after the end of the war in Burma so and he lived he passed away in 1984 uh, Fred Nile. so this, this small chapel here in front of us connects uh, puts together Christians and Jews or are together you have on one side of the chapel the Torah the Jewish book of prayer on the other side the Latin cross and on the back of the chapel the Latin cross and at the bottom the Star of David in order to show that we are all equals